good evening. Welcome to our Ash Wednesday service at the beginning of Lent. First, let me describe how this evening will work. Uh, first of all, do all of you have your small communion kits that you will need? If not, they're out on the table. So this is the way we'll do ashes, and, and it worked well at the noon time. Uh, if you'll notice, along the rail here, there are just a few little plastic communion cups with ashes in them. And so when it comes time to distribute ashes, uh, you can come forward either individually, or if you're in a pod, you know, in your bubble with somebody that you spend time with, uh, the family can come together or the couple can come together, and you can actually distribute ashes to each other. If you're here by yourself, you'll take the cup and you'll put your own ashes on your own head while I speak the words. Uh, and then you'll take the little cup with you and dispose of it on the way out. Uh, so uh, I have plenty of cups here pre-filled with these ashes, so uh, that's the way that'll work. And, and I think it'll be all right. Um, in terms of other things coming up, so uh, Sunday morning, Paula and my uh, daughter Maggie are going to be available uh, for families who bring their children to worship on Sunday morning. If we have a few kids, they'll be taken to the fellowship hall after the gospel reading. And they'll do, no matter how many kids there are, what ages they are, they'll do a single group thing, uh, maybe an activity, maybe a retelling of the story, something like that. And then they'll be returned back here as the parents are ready to exit the church uh, at the end of the service. So that's a, a new thing we're going to be trying, and, and we're uh, hopeful for that. Uh, Bible studies continue Tuesdays at Zoom at uh, 6 o'clock, and we're going to be beginning this coming week the uh, first epistle of John. You can read the first couple chapters of John if you want to, in preparation for that. Uh, I feel like I'm forgetting something, but if I remember it, I will tell you. Uh, tonight's service, of course, is a unique service in its structure. The confession is longer and in a little different place uh, as we enter this uh, Lenten season. So, at this time, I will invite you into the prayer of the day. Would you please stand? The Lord be with you. Gracious God, out of your love and mercy, you breathed into dust the breath of life, creating us to serve you and our neighbors. Call forth our prayers and acts of kindness, and strengthen us to face our mortality with confidence in the mercy of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the first scripture reading. This reading is in the second chapter of Joel. Blow the trumpet at Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness spread upon the mountains, a great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old, nor will it be again after them in ages to come. Yet even now, says the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. Rend your hearts and not your clothing. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love, and relents from punishing. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the aged, gather the children, even infants at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her canopy. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord, and do not make your heritage a mockery, a byword among the nations. Why should it be said among the peoples? Where is their God? The psalm is the 51st psalm, and uh, if you wish, you may uh, speak it from your pews along with me as I read. 
Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless when you pass judgment. Indeed, I was born guilty, a sinner when my mother conceived me. You desire truth in the inward being, therefore teach me wisdom in my secret heart. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain in me a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from bloodshed, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your deliverance. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. For you have no delight in sacrifice. If I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Our second uh, scripture reading is in 2 Corinthians in the fifth chapter. This is St. Paul writing. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we work together with him, we urge you also not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. See, now is the acceptable time. See, now is the day of salvation. We are putting no obstacle in anyone's way, so that no fault may be found with our ministry. But as servants of God, we have commended ourselves in every way through great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, labors, sleepless nights, hunger, by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, holiness of spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God. With the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left, in honor and dishonor, in ill repute and good repute, we are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet are well known, as dying and see, we are alive, as punished and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing everything. We hear now an anthem recorded uh, to be played.
Please stand for the gospel acclamation and the reading of the Holy Gospel. Return to the Lord your God. The Holy Gospel according to Matthew in the sixth chapter. Jesus said, Beware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be praised by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your alms may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners and at the big churches too, so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they're fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you this day from God the Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is talking here about not being hypocritical. Of course, he's speaking to his people of his time, but oh, that, those words echo right down to us, don't they? I mean, that, that the fact of our lives, the fact of our lives, the fact that we have a public face, we have a, we have a, a public persona, that we, we put on uh, a, a, a front, you know, and everybody does this. I mean, this isn't just for, you know, the loathsome and the deceitful. This is, this is humanity. We, we believe that we want to, to express the best of ourselves when we're at work or when we're with our friends or when we're at a family dinner. Well, some of us have family members that don't bother to put on any face, but, but you know what I mean. So we try to put on a good exterior, and it happens at church a lot. One of the reasons some people are uncomfortable coming to church, ironically, is that church people try to be so nice in church. <laughs> and people who know that they're all crumpled up inside, they, 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 that they don't feel like they belong there. They don't know. They don't see right away what's really inside. But you and I know, we know that there's another part of us. There's a, there's a facade. That, that we put up, but, but behind that facade there's the real, the real me. And the real me isn't, isn't what I want you to see. So there is a kind of, uh, of daily hypocrisy that's just part of who we are. And, and it's not even all bad, I don't believe. I mean, we wouldn't want to go out into the world and show our worst selves all the time. That, that wouldn't make any sense. So of course we try to behave ourselves in public. But, there is a sense in which that, that facade can sometimes even fool ourselves. We can begin to sort of believe about ourselves, that we don't need all this repentance business. I mean, that's for real sinners, you know. <laughs> that's for people who are really bad. I mean, we're, we're good folks. We're decent. We do like our neighbors. Sometimes we even love our neighbors. We, we, we're generous with our money, and, and, and we try to help the poor and the hungry, and we do all those good things. We're not really bad. So what is this all this repentance about? And why would Joel, this ancient prophet, why would he say that the day of the Lord is like darkness and gloom? And why, why would Jesus here say that, you know, if, if your treasure is too much in this world, it's all going to go. The, the, the rust will come and the moth will come and the thieves will come and it disappears. It's all, it's all temporal. It's all temporary. It's all flashy. It's all... Well, as we're going to say in a little bit, it's just dust. It's just fancy dust. 
your house, your car, your clothes, all the things that you treasure in this world. Again, not that they're all bad, of course, but they are all temporary. And when the day of the Lord comes, a permanent thing will replace the temporary. And there will be some unsettledness about that. And when the day of the Lord comes, any facade that we've managed to keep up in front of our neighbors, well, it won't stand in front of God. And we're going to realize what this repentance business is about. Letting go of the things that we've treasured in this world that amount to, really, dust and rust. Letting go of the pretense that we don't need to repent. Letting go of the, the image that we have somehow, sometimes even convinced ourselves to believe that, that we could actually stand in the presence of God and not fall to our knees trembling. All that will go away. And some of us have experienced that in, in times of our lives. Uh, the 12-step groups talk about people hitting rock bottom, and some of us have been either there or pretty close. We've seen, we've seen what it's like to be, to be exposed for who's inside of us. And, and some of us have, have learned that the, the glorious holiness of God shines a light into those deep, shadowy places in a, in a way that's uncomfortable. And some of us have experienced that the, that the power of God's promise for all eternity is also a kind of, of a judgment on, on the way we cling so hard to our trinkets in the world. I mean, oh, when we have to let go of all that. So the day of the Lord can feel like a heavy thing. One of the geniuses, actually, I believe about our faith, I believe the Jewish faith... Uh, embraces this idea as well as and, and so do the Muslims for that matter all of these Abrahamic faiths have this same general idea which is this it is not necessary to separate the the onerous and heavy need for repentance and and real uh, uh, a real kind of uh, turning away from a life that we once embraced it, there's no reason to separate that from the confidence in the promise that God makes of a brand new life and a whole new kind of existence that brings out joy. So much of the world's trouble, I believe this as a person who studied psychology, so much of the world's trouble is based on the fact that people either embrace one or the other. They either embrace the fact that humanity is so broken that, I mean, it's like on our own terms, who, who could be saved? We even hear that in the scriptures. Lord, <laughs> who, who could be saved? Who could stand? Or, and they deny, they deny the possibility of a, of a hopeful inheritance at the end of all things because they can't make those two fit together. And then there are other people who can't face the repentance piece. They can't face the sin piece. I've actually known people who would, uh, would not go to church during Holy Week because all that, all that sin talk, <laughs> you know, crucifixion, who needs that? I just want to wait till Easter. You know, they can only cling to the joy. They can only cling to the hope. They can only cling to the promise, but they can't face the need for true contrition and true repentance. Our faith says these things go together. Life's hard sorrows and struggles are intermingled with a confident promise in an inheritance that comes from God. And Keeping these two paradoxical things in tension is part of what makes this a viable faith for the real world. If the hope that Jesus proclaimed cannot be proclaimed to people who are wrestling with real sin, it doesn't mean a thing. And if the repentance that we seek is unable to cling to the hope of the, of the inheritance, then it's nothing but a morbid kind of navel-gazing. We need to remember that these go together. Real human beings who have real spiritual needs, real brokenness in their lives. These are the people to whom Christ came. Didn't he say it? I don't come for the healthy, I come for the sick, the spiritually sick. A broken and a contrite heart, O oh Lord, you will not despise. 
I'm inviting you into a Lenten season of a broken and a contrite heart. I love you. I don't mean life to be bad for you. But we, together, we need to recognize that that facade that we have, as necessary as it is for polite company, is only that. And there's a real person inside that has some different characteristics. <laughs> and, and we need to, to face that, and we need to repent of it, and we need to ask God to cleanse that and transform it. And while all that's going on, we need to hear the gospel. Gospel of grace. I wouldn't ask you to stand in front of a harsh judge and expose all that sin. That would be hopeless. But I will ask you to stand in front of a gracious judge and expose it because that's where real forgiveness happens and then our lives are different. Once we're not trying to fool ourselves anymore and we know we're not fooling God, something opens in the heart, something opens in the mind, something is changed in the life and we're freer. We really begin to live. So the day of the Lord, whenever it comes to you in whatever form it comes to you, uh, and it's hard to predict that, but uh, it, it, it won't feel always like a walk in the park. But it will contain the true promise of eternity. Our good friend C.S. Lewis uh, used a phrase that I, I think applies in a case like this. He said that what Christians experience in the presence of Christ is a severe mercy. It's a severe mercy because it's a mercy that requires that we admit what it is we need mercy for. Or as again, as our 12-step friends say, it is a... It is a a searching moral inventory. So I'm inviting you into that. I don't mind knowing you with the facade that you put up. You're very nice people. And, and you don't have to expose all of your dirty laundry to everybody else here in a public way. But you do need to understand that God sees through that and that you too can see through that. And the process of doing that, as long as we cling to the promise of grace at the end, is truly life-giving. So the day of the Lord is coming. And for some of us, it'll feel dark for a while. But there's light. There's light in the promise, in the person of Christ. In the person of Christ. Adrian will now play for us a couple of verses of O oh Lord throughout these 40 days. Friends in Christ, today with the whole church we enter the time of remembering Jesus' Passover from death to life and our life in Christ is renewed. We begin this holy season by acknowledging our need for repentance and for God's mercy. We're created to experience joy in communion with God and to love one another and to live in harmony with creation. But our sinful rebellion separates us from God, our neighbors and creation so that we do not enjoy the life our Creator intended. As disciples of Jesus, we're called to a discipline that contends against evil and resists whatever leads us away from the love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to the discipline of Lent, self-examination and repentance, prayer and fasting, 
sacrificial giving and works of love, strengthened by the gifts of word and sacrament. Let us continue our journey through these 40 days to the great three days of Jesus' death and resurrection. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Please take a moment of silence to reflect upon your lives. Join me, please. We confess to you and to one another and before the whole company of heaven that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own fault, by our own most grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. We have shut our ears to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved your Holy Spirit. Our past unfaithfulness, the pride, envy, hypocrisy, and apathy that have infected our lives, we confess to you. Our self-indulgent appetites and ways and our exploitation of other people, we confess to you. Our negligence in prayer and worship and our failure to share the faith that is in us, we confess to you. Our neglect of human need and suffering and our indifference to injustice and cruelty, we confess to you. Our false judgments, our uncharitable thoughts toward our neighbors, and our prejudice and contempt toward those who differ from us, we confess to you. Our waste and pollution of your creation and our lack of concern for those who come after us, we confess to you. Restore us, O oh God, and let your anger depart from us. Almighty God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. May these ashes be a sign of our mortality and penitence, reminding us that only by the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ are we given eternal life through the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. As I said at the beginning, then you may come forward uh, to one of the six little cups and uh, I will replenish it as it is used. You may come as a, a pair or a family to uh, impose ashes upon one another and, uh, and I will speak. Uh, you can speak the words to each other as well. Remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Would you please say those words to me?
Accomplish in us, O God, the work of your salvation. By the cross and passion of your Son, our Savior, Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Let us pray for all in need. For the church, that we may repent and be renewed, Lord, in your mercy. For those who hold high office, that they may be servants and agents of justice, Lord, in your mercy. For the planet, that it may sustain our human family, Lord, in your mercy. For any other needs that we know, please now lift any petitions that are on your hearts. Lord, in your mercy, into your hands, dear Lord, we commend our prayers. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. You may turn uh, to the people again in your family or, uh, or our bubble and uh, share a close sign of peace and then look across the room and, and wave or smile behind your mask or something to uh, send a sign of peace to another. The Lord be with you. I invite you to stand at this time as we begin now to prepare for our Eucharist. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it to them to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. As our Lord taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, please uh, open your communion packs and receive those elements there. The body of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Let us pray. Merciful God, accompany our journey through these 40 days. Renew us in the gift of baptism that we may provide for those who are poor, pray for those in need, fast from self-indulgence, and above all, that we may find our treasure in the life of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Go forth into the world to serve God with righteousness. Be of good courage. 
Hold fast to what is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for coming this evening. As the ushers direct you, please uh, exit the building for our common safety, and may you go forth in peace.